it's a, this is a show of a sovereign or slave, and we, we discuss how to um, protect our rights when dealing with the government. So today, my guest here is George, and he's going to explain how to beat a traffic ticket. So George, take it away. All right. Uh, now, let's make it clear that we are not attorneys, and this is not legal device. It's for educational purposes only, as a community service. Since we've not been to a uh, law school, we don't even know what legal advice is, so we can't even make that determination. Now, we need to go over the foundational principles. And the main issue here is that no law requires a man or a woman to obtain a driver's license, registration, insurance, etc. So let's discuss this first, the driver's license, registration, insurance. <coughs> it's really uh, our duty to understand what our requirements are. And when we go into the uh, codes, we see that they apply to persons. Now, a person we'll get into later in terms of what that really means. But when you apply for a driver's license application, you have to understand that application literally means begging. You're begging the state to give you a driver's license as a privilege to replace what you have as a common right to travel. So let's make that clear. You're, you're giving up your common right to travel for a privilege, which is driving. Now, the right to travel has been long established. For instance, there's a famous case, Chicago Motor Coach for, uh, versus Chicago, which says that the use of the highway for the purpose of travel and transportation is not a mere privilege, but a common fundamental right of which the public and individuals can not rightfully be deprived. And also in uh, Ruckenbrod versus Mullins, a state cannot impose restrictions on the acceptance of a license that will deprive the licensee of his constitutional rights. So where then does the state, uh, the police officers and so forth, get their authority? And that's a very, very important question. If we look at California Vehicle Code <coughs> Section 17460, it says that the acceptance or retention by a resident of this state of a driver's license issued pursuant to the provisions of this code shall constitute the consent of the person that servants of summons may be made upon him within or without this state, whether or not he is then a resident of the state, and an action brought in the courts of this state upon a cause of action arising in this state out of his operation of a motor vehicle anywhere within the state. So I'd, I'd like to uh, point out that um, there is an example of a self-executing contract. So when they say that if you have a driver's license that you're consenting to service and you're consenting to the codes applying to you, have you ever actually consented to that? Did they explain that you could travel in your own private conveyance, in your own private property, in your car, truck, van, without a license to drive because driving is a commercial activity? And if you can, if they can um, perform self-executing contracts on you, then you should have the same right as they do to perform self-executing contracts on, on them. Good point. Technically, it's not a contract because a contract requires two parties. You're, what you're really doing is you're making an agreement to perform uh, relative to whatever it says on that piece of paper. Well, they refer to them as adhesion contracts. Right. So the application uh, are begging for a driver's license gives consent to the state. And, it, and note again that it says, shall constitute the consent of the person. 
It doesn't say man or woman. And we'll get into that as uh, uh, it says in California Vehicle Code Section uh, 12500 a a person may not drive a motor vehicle upon a highway unless the person then holds a valid driver's license issued under this code except those persons who are expressly exempted under this code so there's that word person again and it keeps popping up not a man or a woman but a person but how is a driver defined because it's talking about uh, driving and a driver's license. It's in California Vehicle Code Section 305. Driver. A driver is a person who drives or is in actual physical control of a vehicle. Now that vehicle is another special word and we have to understand that government doesn't do any anything by accident. The laws and codes, statutes, rules and regulations are very specific in what they're trying to communicate. We, but we have to know what the words are because they are a form of code. <coughs> there, a lot of the laws are in Latin because Latin is a dead language and therefore it doesn't change. And so the meanings of the words don't change. But you have to know the specific definitions because we cannot assume that they have the common meaning. Very often a uh, legal term will be ha will have the exact opposite meaning of its common usage. So how is a vehicle defined? It's under California Vehicle Code Section 670. Vehicle. A vehicle is a device by which any person or property may be propelled, moved, or drawn upon a highway, excepting a device moved exclusively by human power or used exclusively upon stationary rails or tracks. So. You can see this is United States definitions, Cornell University Law School, U.S. Code. And this is Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 2, Section 32, excuse me, 31, Definitions. And we go down to Motor Vehicle, Number 6. The term motor vehicle means every description of carriage or other contrivance propelled or drawn by mechanical power and used for commercial purposes, see, commercial purposes on the highways in the transportation of passengers, passengers and property, or property and cargo. And then under 10, used for commercial purposes, it states the term used for commercial purposes means the carriage of persons or property, there's that word persons again, of for any fair fee rate charge or other consideration, or directly or indirectly in connection with any business or other undertaking intended for profit. So unless you're getting paid to drive a commercial vehicle, you're not driving a motor vehicle, so it must be something else that you're driving. And in actuality, you're not driving at all. You're traveling. Okay, this is right out of the 2008 uh, California Vehicle Code. And you can see where definitions 15 to 10. So they're stating this is what definitions are for the Vehicle Code, right? And we go over to here. And we see... In the absence of a federal definition, existing definitions under this code shall apply, which means exactly what it says. If there's a federal definition, it's superior to any definition in this vehicle code. And since we saw the federal definition was a motor vehicle is used in commerce, whatever description of a motor vehicle that they use in the vehicle code doesn't matter what they say because it doesn't apply. The federal definition is what applies. Here we go again. Uh, the person and another term, highway. Highway does not have the common usage in uh, legal definitions. It's defined in the Vehicle Code Section 360. Highway 
is a way or place of whatever nature publicly maintained and open to the use of the public for purposes of vehicular travel. Highway includes street. Now we have uh, that vehicle thing again. It, it's de in other words, highway is defined as purposes for vehicular travel. So we clearly see that uh, the cunning of the attorneys here because they define vehicle in the context of highway, then they define highway in the context of vehicle. But now for the final insult. How is person defined? It's in California Vehicle Section 470. Person. Person includes a natural person, firm, co-partnership, association, limited liability company, or corporation. Now just think about that. Every one of those words, firm, co-partnership, association, limited liability company, or corporation, is an artificial entity. It's not a natural uh, c creation. But person also includes a natural person. So how can they define one word by using the same word? Uh, and we see their greater cunning because all the definitions include only artificial entities. The term includes means that it excludes any other definitions. And that's another uh, word of art that, that they use to think that it includes uh, all these things plus other things, and it doesn't. It, 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 whatever it's defined as excludes any other definition. Anybody to believe me, so this is right out of Black's Law. Inclusio unius est exclusio alteris. The inclusion of one is the exclusion of another. The certain designation of one person is absolute exclusion of all others. So when we say the word includes only means the words that follow the words includes. Like if you said this room includes the chairs, then legally only the chairs would be um, what you're speaking about. Whereas we use the includes as in addition to, like the room includes the chairs, you're not going to say the room doesn't have a table in it and doesn't have paintings on the walls and everything else. You're just going to say that in addition to everything else that's in the room, the chairs are in the room. But from a legal standpoint, it would only mean the chairs if you said includes the chairs. So uh, let's not be fooled by the inclusion of the word uh, natural person because it is not valid to define a phrase using the same word. The, the new phrase only takes on the characteristics of the original word. Therefore, a person is an artificial entity. Now, are you an artificial entity? Therefore, are you required to have a driver's license, insurance, and registration? That's what it comes down to. So let's plan our strategy. We need to uh, set up to challenge jurisdiction from the beginning so that uh, we need to show that there's uh, no proof of agreement later in, in court. Now, a lot of you will already have a traffic issue and so uh, you'll want to get into the aspects of defeating it right away, but we need to cover this fundamental foundational thing first in order to understand what our rights are, because only then are we able to defend those rights properly. We plan our strategy. In this case, the next time uh, it happens, or for those that don't have traffic issues right now, we need to, when we apply for the driver's license, we need to show a sign on the dotted line without prejudice or without recourse. That means we're reserving our rights. Because 
there's two f forms of signature. One is called a general, and the other is called a sp special. A general signature is like a blank check. You allow your signature to mean that there's no restriction. So you accept everything, uh, whatever the case, plus more, whatever they want to throw at you. A special signature reserves and is conditional. It reserves rights and, and conditions the, uh, your acceptance as to what you're agreeing to. So when you sign without prejudice or without recourse, it means that you're reserving your rights and they have no recourse to come after you because there's no agreement unless you consent. And that's really uh, the whole crux of this matter because as you recall uh, from California Vehicle Code Section 17460, it shall con constitute the consent of the person when you agree uh, to accept apply for that driver's license. The, the signature line might be small, so if there is no room to write uh, without prejudice or with, without recourse uh, above your name, then just write uh, without prejudice alone, without uh, uh, putting down your name. Sometimes the clerk uh, will also challenge that signature. There, becoming smart to this game. So uh, that might be a strategy as well in order to prevent that because they normally don't take that close a look at the signature. But if you print something up there, then that might uh, alert them to the fact that you're not agreeing to that adhesion contract. The uh, officer or the judge or the prosecutor will often uh, ask you about passengers or vehicle or highway and if you answer to those questions you're admitting that you are actually in commerce <coughs> so we have to be very careful how we answer the questions now let's discuss the traffic stop here again they rope us into agreeing, consenting, it's called tacit procuration. We have to understand the first principle and that is that the officer that puts on his emergency lights and pulls you over is not a sworn peace officer. If you ask them, are you a sworn peace officer? They'll answer something like, I'm a highway patrol officer or I'm a police officer. This is because they are not lawful, but only enforcement officers that enforce the corporate policy, the code of the private corporation known as the state of California or the county of Sonoma or the city of San Francisco or whatever. So they're not lawful, they're legal. And we have to understand the distinction between those two terms. Legal basically means uh, fraud. All legal process is fraudulent because it's not lawful. It, it's not according to the common law. They're writing codes, statutes, rules, and regulations. Uh, and that term itself, code, is interesting because it is in code. It's not open and uh, clear. You have to have legal interpretation of the code. If it were all lawful, it would be very clear, it would be simple to understand, even the average uh, uh, man on the street could understand it, but because it's legal jargon in a foreign language, it's actually a foreign language. But getting to the traffic stop, this is what you might say the original transaction. And it really is a transaction because it's in commerce. Remember that the officer is a, an enforcement officer. He enforces the code. Now there's a lot of evidence that the state of California and the county of so forth and the city of so forth are private, 
corporations, and and we can present that uh, at a d different time. But f uh, at this point, we'll, we'll just have to presume that that's correct. So he represents. It's kind of like Brinks Security, who uh, have those armored cars and have their own security service. It's kind of like a Brinks Security. Uh, officer stopping you, turning on his emergency light, stopping you by the side of the road and giving you a ticket. What authority does he have to do that? It's exactly the same case. What authority well, does any... He's got a gun. That's right. <laughs> and you don't. <laughs> well, that's, that's the crux of the matter, okay? And uh, basically, we're under duress when we enter into these agreements, and that's uh, a, another argument that we we'll go over later, but point being that the officer of a private company, whether it's called Brinks or whether it's called uh, uh, California Highway Patrol, California Highway Patrol, whatever, has no authority to make a claim upon you. That's exactly what they're doing. When they give you a ticket, it's a claim. It's a, it's a bill. What do they call those? A true bill in commerce? Yeah. Or a bill of exchange? Uh, bill of attainder. Bill of attainder, yeah. Yes. And that's a special uh, thing that uh, has no lawful authority. It's all legal. <coughs> a traffic stop is not an emergency. But when the officer turns on his lights, he creates an emergency. And that is strictly against the law. M most people don't understand that. And, and that, that alone can be challenged. Now, there's a very important maxim of law, and that is that he who asks the questions is in control. So you have to understand that we can never, ever answer the questions directly. In other words, we can't say yes or no, or uh, when he asks, do you know how, long, how fast you are going? so on and so on. You'll be testifying against yourself. Exactly. And that recorder is always playing. They have uh, video cameras, they have recorders on, on their person. So that testimony is going to convict you in court. Therefore, never ever answer a question directly. Always answer a question with a question. Such as, if he comes up to your <coughs> window and says... Uh, Do you know how fast you were going? Yeah. Say, in, in the first place, you, you don't know him from Adam, okay, him or her. You have to ask them, uh, who are you? May I see your identification, please? Are you a sworn peace officer? They're not going to answer that question, of course, but at least you're taking control now because you're the one that's asking the questions and they are required to answer those. They are required by law to show identification and give you a business card. And take your time when you write down their name and badge number because you're not inconveniencing them. They're, they're getting paid for this and you're not. They're inconveniencing you. So when you get their ID uh, and so forth, and they ask you for a driver's license, you can say, uh, well, what's a driver's license? Uh, please define that. Uh, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. Yes. Can you give me the legal definition of a driver's license? Exactly. What are you looking for, sir? In other words, you play dumb because everything that they are asking you for are legal things, all right? And we're not required to have legal things. We're only required to have lawful things. So if they can't define what they're asking for, then how can you give it to them? And guess what? They're not, they're, they have never been asked these questions before. They don't know the answers. They don't know the answer to uh, the legal definition of a driver's license or insurance or the legal definition of registration. Or what a motor vehicle is. Exactly. So, a my, lot of times... My favorite is I was, uh, <clears throat> I 
accused of drive, driving a motor vehicle on a suspended license and the sheriff couldn't give me the legal definition of motor vehicle. So I said, well, how do you know if I was driving one? <laughs> right, and this is a way to impeach them uh, later on uh, at the hearing, at the court hearing. But for the time being, we have to make it as difficult for them as possible because after all, they're making it difficult for us. Uh, it's, it's a very stressful thing to be stopped by these thugs. Now, that's all they are. It's, it's, a, it's a government mafia operation. So you have to make them toe the line. You have to hold their feet to the fire. If you don't do that, then you're not going to get anywhere. If, if you do not stand up for your rights, then you don't have any. It's as simple as that. Yes, if you don't ask the question, you won't get the evidence to bring up later that I asked you to show that you have a, a jurisdiction over me. I asked you to, sh to, to show me, give me your name and, and uh, sh explain that you have a valid oath of office before I can allow you to proceed you know, as a uh, peace officer. Otherwise, it'll be criminal intent to impersonate a police officer. If you don't ask the questions and get the answers, then you won't be able to state that later. And since they do have recording devices on, you can subpoena the recording device records and it would show up that you did ask those questions. Right. It's a good idea to carry one of these. It's a uh, voice recorder in, on your person at all times because we're eventually we're going to get stopped. I mean, it can be a stupid thing, uh, like forgetting to signal a turn or something of that nature, or having one of your tail lights out. But we need to uh, challenge jurisdiction from the beginning. From the very beginning, we we need to establish our rights and who's in, in charge. Most people's uh, cell phones will record uh, the, uh, audio, so. Practice with your cell phone, and if you get pulled over, you know, fiddle with your phone and start recording. Right. So there's only really a handful of responses that are safe. For one, you can say, I don't understand, and, if, and he has to uh, be cognizant of that, because if you don't understand, then he has to explain it to you. You can say, are you asking me to testify? And guess what? That's exactly what he's asking you to do. So, so you can basically tell him that uh, you know what the game is. Yes, before I answer another question, I'm going to have to have my lawyer present. <laughs> right. So that would stop the questioning. That's another tack. And you can say, also say, uh, I do not consent. So you continue to challenge jurisdiction until either you prevail and they f figure out that uh, you're not, you're not a, a, an easy sheep like the rest of them, or basically he's ready to put you in jail for obstructing uh, an officer or some other trumped up charge of that nature. So but they're going to establish the fact that they have jurisdiction the minute you give them the name and the license. That is their defining moment of getting power over you. So they will do everything they can to get you to give them their, your name, address, and license. That's a very important point. When you look on your driver's license, registration, insurance, credit card, mortgage, any document of that nature, the name is spelled in all capital letters. Now, when a name is spelled in all capital letters, that means it's a corporation. There's no accident that the name, which sounds like your name, but is spelled in all caps, uh, is spelled that way. I mean, we have supercomputers, for God's sake. They can't uh, uh, use proper English in writing our name. Actually, I. 
you know, I was sitting around with my buddy the other day, and he had a 1971 California driver's license in his possession, very faded and very old, and the name on the driver's license was in upper and lower case. I couldn't believe it. Right, because today everything is uh, in all caps. So you have to understand that when you admit that you are that artificial entity spelled in all caps, when they, when they are call out that name and you answer to it, you're answering that you are going to be surety for any claims against that name. So th that's an important understanding and we'll have to go uh, deeper into that later on, but for the time being, the important point is that we do not answer the name and uh, when they ask us to, uh, who, who we are, they will also ask for uh, birth date. When were you born? Because they need the name and the number together. W one or the other alone uh, will not satisfy their requirements. So they're always going to ask you for your birth date. And you can say, well, I don't know when I was born. I, d I didn't know how to count at that time or something of that nature, which is true. It's all hearsay evidence. Uh, well, when, when did your mom say you were born? Well, my mom uh, told me about uh, Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, and the Easter Bunny, so I can't rely on her testimony. <laughs> something of that nature, right? all right? Yeah, I don't know is a really good form. And, uh, you know, there's, if, you know, I don't know is a big one for lawyers when they don't want to reveal the truth. It's not a lie, but it's, you know, I don't know. That's right. So uh, we looked at the strategy. Uh, we've planned the strategy. So when you set up to challenge jurisdiction, number one, you have to do it from the get-go. Number two, you need a plan or a script to go by, and we're giving you that here. And uh, But w when you do that, you, ha you have to practice it, because if, unless you do that with a friend or in front of a mirror, then yes. the, the dress of the situation is going to make you forget. If forget. you don't do this role play for quite a bit of time until you quit saying the word vehicle every time role play partner talks to you, you won't get it right. All right, so in applying our strategy, uh, we have to understand that we do not have to pull over on the shoulder of the freeway or some other busy and dangerous place. You can just keep going to a public parking lot, a gas station, or a other safe place. Church parking lot is uh, pretty nice because it's private property and they have less jurisdiction on private property than they do on, on public places. Yeah. Say the word sanctuary. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or you can even uh, return back to your house uh, if you're you know, not too far away and park in your drive. I have a friend of mine who told me that he's been on numerous <coughs> slow speed chases. I had to laugh. And, and that's a very important point because there have been instances when someone just kept going and going and going and the uh, officer finally uh, got tired, turned off, turned off his light and gave, gave uh, up the chase because you're giving the officer an opportunity to go by you, especially if you slow down. So if it's an emergency, uh, he should be going by you, right? Uh, but if he's stopping you, then where's the emergency? Has there any uh, been any uh, one in, in danger? Has anyone's life or property been in danger? That's what constitutes an emergency. Now, when the officer demands that you give your driver's license, uh, registration, insurance, uh, as we said before, you respectfully demand, you don't ask, you respectfully demand, who are you? Please show me your identification. 
and uh, keep repeating that request until they prove it. I had an instance once where the officer uh, just kept uh, barking at me. I mean, he was pretty insulting. And I caved because I didn't understand these principles before. So you have to keep repeating uh, your respectful demand because they are required to give you ID. Otherwise, you're dealing with a complete total stranger. I mean, I could say, uh, you know, I don't know who you are. I, I can get a monkey suit like that in any costume shop and a tin star and impersonate an officer. So please uh, uh, identif identify yourself. If there is a, a problem, just tell them to call their watch commander. He's going to know the rules better than they are. Now, the officer at that point will say something like, do you know how fast you were going? Or do you know why I pulled you over? And again, don't answer it directly. I know it's, it's very difficult, but this is why we have to study the script and make sure that we know <coughs> the principle as to not uh, answering directly. They're trying to entrap you. You're trying to get your consent. If they didn't need your consent, then they could pull you over at any time and demand payment at that very moment. But obviously, they can't do that because something, another principle is working here, and that's consent. Yeah, why don't they just give a ticket to the license number of the car? And I mean, they could pull you over and go, hey, I'm going to use the um, your license plate as your identification, and here, you're, you know, I'm giving you a ticket. No, they have to get your name, and they have to get your license, because they have to get the driver, because they are a witness. And when they sign under penalty of perjury that they witnessed this, and they witnessed you doing it, that's their testimony. That's their sworn testimony. Only it's interesting that they don't make it out to you, they make the ticket out to the person. Right, they make the ticket out to the all caps name, if you notice uh, when they write it up. Uh, one other thing you can say is, can I help you? My fee for assistance is $7,500 an hour. And is this a social call or is this business? Exactly. <laughs> you can also file a fee schedule uh, and record it in the, into the public record. And that will put them on notice that if you are hassled in any way, then... Where they don't have a lawful claim. I mean, if they see you hitting somebody, that's a different story. Right. That's an injury and that's a crime. But a violation of their code is con completely contractual uh, because there's no injury involved there. So at least you put them on notice that, hey, if uh, you need my help, uh, I'll, I'll be ha happy to help you for $7,500 an hour. Um, Do you understand? Exactly. <laughs> and if they proceed, well, that's their tacit uh, agreement that, that they're contracted with you. Well, Self-executing contract. Your proceeding will be your consent to pay me. <laughs> there you go. Now, the officer will continue to demand that you give your driver's license, registration, and insurance. <coughs> and <coughs> as we mentioned before, you have to keep asking, I don't understand what you're demanding. Please define driver's license. Please define insurance. Please define registration. Um, they're not going to be able to do that because they've never been asked that question. So just uh, continue to play dumb. And uh, you can also say, are you making a legal determination that I'm a driver or that I was driving? Or are you making a legal determination that my private car is a motor vehicle? And since they're not lawyers and haven't been to law school, they can't make legal determinations. Exactly. And that's one way of impeaching them if it ever gets that far. But the whole point of this process is that we, we don't let it get that far because the way to win is to challenge jurisdiction. If we hire an attorney, we give up 
prestige jurisdiction automatically. And uh, unless we have an attorney contract, they're going to basically cut a deal for us. So the whole purpose of this exercise is to help you to understand what your rights are and how to uh, affect them. It depends on how far you want to test your officer's patience. But at some point they're going to call a watch commander if you've not uh, demanded to do so first. Your choice will probably be either going to jail or giving them the information that they want. Now, some people are so outraged by this fraud that they're going to test them to the limit. And uh, so they would be happy to be arrested and, and uh, go to jail because that is called unlawful imprisonment. There's no, there's no uh, real cause for their doing that. There's no crime having been committed. There's no injured party and so forth and so on. So if you do go to jail or choose to go to jail, then give them no information whatsoever. Not a name, not a birth date, not an address, nothing. Uh, give your wallet to a friend in the car if you have a, f a friend with you or, or uh, hide it if possible, but likely the car would be towed unless you parked it on private property. So that's kind of risky. But on the way to jail and during the entire process, you're going to keep consenting, or you're going to keep uh, saying, I object, I do not consent, I do not understand, and that's all you say. No matter what, no matter what they say, that's all you say. Because without your consent, again, as Jeff points out, they have no cause to proceed. Now, if you do choose to give them the information, the driver's license, and so forth, then uh, continue continue to uh, object and say, "Do not consent to these unlawful proceedings. I am under duress." I do not consent to contract with you. I follow your orders only at the barrel of a gun. And that's a pretty powerful testimony. And when the officer demands that you sign a ticket, always sign without recourse. That means they have no recourse to uh, come after you. When you do that, then they have no case. Well, they usually don't give you much space to sign on the ticket because naturally they don't want any qualifiers on your signature, so they give you just enough space to sign your name. So what I've taken to doing is sign it like judges sign their name. You know that if you ever get a judge's signed order, you won't be able to read what their name is. <coughs> you go to school, and in school they teach you to sign your name clearly and legibly, and you get in trouble if you can't read your name. That's because if you're a good slave, you have to identify yourself. But when you get into positions of power, if you're a big businessman or something like that, in Europe, the people that are in heads of corporations, their names are squiggles because they don't want anybody to be able to read it and come back on them and use it against them and identify them. If, they, if that document goes anywhere, they don't want anybody to be able to identify who signed it. So you look at judge signatures and they're always squiggles. Start practicing signing your name with just your initials, you know, B-A-D, you know, and you draw it out a bunch of times. Your signature is whatever you say your signature is. That's it. If I say my signature is three dots, then that's what my signature is. Remember all the Westerns where, where Whitey signed his name by just putting an X down there? Why do you think that X qualified as Whitey's signature? because he said it did. And nobody else signs an X the way Whitey signs an X. So that's Whitey's signature. So start signing your name and make it smaller, you know, make it very small. And then on a traffic ticket, you can sign your very small name with just the words U slash D. And the U slash D is under duress. So when you go to court and then ch you want to challenge the judge, I signed the ticket under duress, and if he looks at the ticket, he's going to see that you put U backslash D. And he goes, well, that's not under duress. What do you think it stands for? Under development? What? I, it, my intention when I signed it was that the UD was for under duress. 
because I was under duress. All right. Um, I don't know if we'll have enough time to get into the court, but just a quick review of court procedures. The foundational principles. Yep. We have to understand that they have to prove jurisdiction just as the officer has to prove jurisdiction uh, to arrest you. They have to prove jurisdiction. They have to prove a crime. They have to present the real party in interest. They have to have valid oaths. They have to have valid charging instruments. And if there's no contract and you've signed your ticket the way properly and your driver's license properly, then there's, there's no contract and they have no cause to proceed. So, however, the hardest part is is that um, <coughs> the judge is going to beat you up. I mean, he wants to take your money. Just look at him like he's a thief out to steal your money. He's not fair and impartial, and he's not there to to mete out justice. He's there to take your money. So if you start challenging him, if you go to traffic court and you sit in there and you watch all morning, everybody will bow and scrape and lower their eyes and they'll never challenge the judge. So he's not used to having somebody come in there and say, you know, I don't believe that I have a contract with you, Your Honor. Oh, you're going to challenge me? Okay, I'll show you who's really in control. Because they are masters at getting you to bow and scrape and they're going to challenge you, they're going to threaten you. My friend was in court yesterday and he said that uh, when he stood up to be counsel for his friend, the judge asked him if he would like to be incarcerated today. Now that might seem kind of funny if it was casual conversation, but when the judge who believes they have the power to have the bailiff throw you in jail actually makes you an offer like that, it's Obviously, it's a question. It's not an, if you say one more word, I'm going to put you in jail for contempt of court. He didn't say it like that. But on the other hand, what he's doing is he's threatening you. And so if the judge threatens you like that, it's like, excuse me, Your Honor, are you threatening me? <laughs> yes. So um, let's go over what we've learn today. Uh. Okay, what I've put up here is the timeline for the traffic ticket and we're going to do a little recap of what we've discussed today. And so you can see in the first box, um, the first at the first point you could be at would be to file some kind of declaration of your status, you know, send DMV an affidavit and a self-executing contract which would state something to the effect that you know, I don't drive a motor vehicle, and here's the legal definition of what a motor vehicle is, and since I don't charge anybody for hauling uh, their person, their, you know, their... Passengers, cargo. <laughs> passengers and cargo, then I don't uh, drive a motor vehicle, and I don't believe there's any evidence to the contrary. In other words, if you have any evidence showing that I am driving a motor vehicle and I'm getting paid for it, bring it forward. Otherwise, we're going to have an agreement that I'm traveling in my private conveyance and I am not required to have registration. I'm not required to have a driver's license and I only have a driver's license and registration under threat and duress because I don't really want to have to hassle with the police pulling me over and taking me to jail and all this, but it doesn't really apply to me. And then this self-executing contract is going to say something to the extent that if you don't rebut my affidavit within 30 days, it's going to be true and I'm going to send you a notice of default and an estoppel that bars you from proceeding against me for being a driver of a driver's license. And here again, this is uh, preparatory to entering these situations. Uh, as we mentioned, a lot of you already have a ticket and so you're going to want to have the remedy right away, but we need to do this, all of us, in order to 
establish that we are not in commerce, that it's a, our private business, and that we're not participating in their scam. And, yeah, this is preemptory. So you want to duck out of their control by sending paperwork in, proof of service, certified mail number, so you can prove this in court. And then, because they're claiming that they're in contract with you, so they're claiming that you need to have a motor vehicle license and driving is a privilege. And driving is a privilege, but you're not asking for the privilege of making money by using the state highways. You're asking for your right to travel. Upon the common ways. And the common ways are defined uh, very specifically, uh, long-standing, we have the right of use of the common ways. And those are the uh, public uh, roads and so forth. And they're not highways, because highways is a statutory term, and we have to separate that. We have to separate statutory from common law. They're, they're two entirely different worlds, two entirely different animals. Okay, so then you're going to establish your rights, your exclusive rights to your private property. Now, <coughs> if you've bought a car and the bank is financing it, you don't have a right to claim that it's your private property. That's an interesting fact, but you've engaged in commerce and you have a loan on that, on that vehicle and therefore you can't claim it's your private property. But if you've paid cash and you own your car outright, it's your private property and the thing that establishes your right to that and your claim to that is the bill of sale. So never throw your bill of sale away. The bill of sale is the superior title. The title that you get at the DMV is an inferior title and not as powerful as the bill of sale that you got when you purchased it. Actually, it's a certificate of title. Most people don't understand that when they register the car that they give up their right to the car, to the ownership, and they get a privilege of use. That's why when you get the so-called title, it'll say at the top, certificate of title, which certifies that they have the title, the state has the title, and that's when whoever bought the car new sent the MCO, the Manufacturer Certificate of Origin, which is a real title to the car, and exchanged that uh, common law right of property ownership for the privilege of use. Of course, I like to think that I can reestablish my private use by making them show that they have a claim, and they'll never <coughs> step forward and say that, that your car is their car. I've never seen them be willing to step forward and sign their name to anything that says, no, no, that's our car. So the next thing that happens is you get stopped and issued a traffic ticket, and you have to establish facts that you'll use later. Your signature on the ticket should be qualified. And the facts that you'll use later are, officer, am I under arrest? If he says, no, you're not under arrest. Oh, good, I'm not under arrest. I'm glad we cleared that up. Because if you were under arrest, he would have to have a Fourth Amendment warrant for you, wouldn't he? And since he doesn't, then, he, then you're not under arrest. And he's saying, but then, then you have to say, okay, then I have a right to leave, right? I'm free to go. And if he says no, and he tries to say, you're being detained. There is no law that allows him to detain you. So he's either arrested you or you're free to go. And if you ask him if he's arrested you and he says no, then technically you can leave. So you're going to get him to state that you are, you know, you basically, if he's forcing you to stay there, then you're under arrest. And your, your rights change at that point. You also have to get the factual evidence of who he is. You have a right to demand his name, his badge number, his business card, and if he refuses to give you these things, then he's um, impersonating a peace officer, wouldn't he be? And then when you sign your ticket, it has to be qualified, as George went into. All right, and these, uh, like we say, are preemptory. So let's. 
go over the um, outline again. Now, the other thing you can do within 72 hours, you can send the ticket back and you need to make three copies. You need to make a copy for the officer who gave it to you, and these are color copies, front and back. You need to make a copy for the court, and you need to make a copy for the prosecutor, who's usually the district attorney. And across each of these copies, you write in red, felt marker, refuse for cause. And what you're doing is you're refusing to contract with them for cause, which is fraud. And unless they can prove that it's not fraud, that it's not duress, that it's not inducement, then uh, there's no contract. And they're never going to do that because they would expose the scam at that point. Yeah, they, they're going to have to show that you have a contract with them or that they have some, you have a liability and that they gave you the ticket because they provided a service and you agreed to pay for that service. Yes, and they're never going to do that. So you, uh, with, and this only works within 72 hours because 72 hours is the co law of contracts. You can cancel any contract that you enter into within 72 hours, even uh, automobile purchases, which uh, they claim you can't. But, but, but if you know how to do that, you can do that. Now, you also send a letter along with the refuse for cause to the clerk of court stating that uh, you want to make sure that there's no fraud in the court because if you cancel contact with the officer, then he's required to notify the court that there's no case at that point. And they never do that. So your position is uh, you're going into court to make sure there's no fraud in the court.